Welcome back to another episode of Jason Bowman Loves Cars. Today's episode is my story of the Lincoln Mark 7. I hope you enjoy it. When I was 16, my best friend and I had a summer job working for the neighbor across the street. It was a fun job. You never really knew what you were going to do until you arrived. One day we would be washing fuel trucks at his father's fuel transfer station. The next day we would be at his house sanding a deck or hanging curtains. Norm was a great guy. He was by all accounts winning at life, having married a beauty queen. He had a king's family, a beautiful home, and a Lincoln Mark 7. The Mark 7 was synonymous with success in our young minds. My friend Dan bought one the first chance he got. It was a 1991 Lincoln Mark 7 Bill Blast. I was always envious of him. I paid my dues and worked hard at my job. I eventually got promoted to manager at the speed shop. Dan casually mentioned he was thinking about selling the Mark 7. I jumped at the chance. The rear axle was shot. Replacing it was a bit of a fiasco. The rear axle is a 91-92 only deal. I couldn't find one, so I ended up getting one out of an 88. I had to transfer the axle shafts, the brakes, the brake lines. It was quite the adventure. The Lincoln served my young family well. I subconsciously lived in constant fear of something insanely expensive breaking or causing me to lose my shirt and trade it in for a car I could actually afford. Thankfully, the Mark 7 never missed a beat. I owned it for 10 years, racking up almost a million kilometers. It just got routine maintenance. What's all this? Looks like Darth Vader's bathroom. The insanely complicated electrical system never had a fault and the infamous air ride failures never occurred. Not only did the Mark 7 play an important role in the young lives of two car crazed geeks in Canada, it also was a significant and important car in general. It was specifically important to Ford and Lincoln. It's difficult to put a name to who penned the Mark 7's design. The Mark 7's design is closely tied to the ninth generation Ford Thunderbird design. Ford President Donald Peterson asked Ford Vice President of Design Jack Telnak, Is this what you would want in your driveway? The 1980 Thunderbird. Telnak said something to the effect of, Oh, oh hells hell no. no! It was decided that the Thunderbird needed a complete redesign. Telnak tasked Dave Royer to tweak the Lincoln Mercury Studios design into the Thunderbird. Not everyone was convinced, however. One person in high-level design management reportedly called it a burnt tennis shoe. The 1982 Lincoln Continental Concept 90 and the 1983 Lincoln Continental Concept 100 gave birth to the 1984 Continental Mark 7. The 1983 Thunderbird was one slippery bird with a coefficient of... Ugh. The 1983 Thunderbird was one slippery bird with a coefficient of drag of 0.35 compared to the barn door-like 1982 Thunderbird 0.50. The Mark 7 was also a smooth operator with 0.38 coefficient of drag. I couldn't find the drag coefficiency numbers on the Mark 6, but I imagine they're not pretty. One of the reasons the Mark 7 was so aerodynamic was it was the first American car with composite headlamps. At the time, this was a mega huge deal. Practically every car has composite headlights now, so it's, so it's hard to fathom. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration finally conceded to allow Lincoln to have its groundbreaking composite headlights. Strangely, the tipping point was the General Electric's 9004 bulb, which had an O-ring seal. The National Highway Safety Traffic Administration's big hang-up was over concerns water would enter the lenses. The Thunderbird had to suffice with sealed beams, which it pulled off eloquently. The 84 Mustang SVO? Not so much. The SVO had to wait until 85 and a half, and the T-Bird and the regular Mustang waited until 1987 to get their composite headlights. Another Mark 7 first was the introduction of electronic four-channel anti-lock brakes on the 1985 LSC. Six whole months before the Corvette. Engines. The 1984 and 1985 Mark 7 Continental had two engine choices. The base engine was a 302 cubic inch 5 liter V8. The 5 liter had 140 horsepower and 250 foot pounds of torque. The 302 came equipped with central fuel injection. Central fuel injection was Ford's fancy term for a two barrel throttle body injection unit. The optional engine was a 2.4 liter turbocharged diesel inline six. The diesel was rated at 115 horsepower and 4,800 RPM and 155 foot-pounds of torque. The Mark 7's turbocharged diesel was designed and built for Lincoln by BMW. These figures seem really low, but apparently it was one of the most powerful passenger car diesels on the market in 1984. The Mark 7 diesel also boasted the most horsepower per liter of any passenger car diesel engine up to that point. In 1986, the diesel was dropped from the engine lineup due to lack of customer demand. Ford had only purchased 3,794 diesel engines from BMW. Presumably, only 3,794 diesel Mark 7s were sold. The 1986 base engine was upgraded from the central fuel injection batch fire 140 horsepower 5 liter V8 to a sequential electronic multi port fuel injected 5 liter V8 engine. 
The big news for 1986 was the LSC Luxury Sports Coupe. The Mark 7 became a proper hot rod Lincoln, receiving the 200 horsepower, 285 foot pound of torque, 5 liter HO, sequential electronic multi port fuel injected engine, the same engine used in the 1986 Mustang GT. The HO included an advanced EEC computer that controlled eight 19 pound injectors. The HO also featured a Hall Effect distributor and 58mm throttle body. A few hot rodder tricks were also incorporated, including a factory roller cam, flat top piston, shorty headers, and dual exhaust. 1987 started out the same way, but an unknown number of 225 horsepower 5 liter HOs made it into the LSCs. The same engine used in the 87 Mustang LX 5 liter and the Mustang GTs. The 1987 HO was hot rodded further with larger 60 millimeter throttle body, an internally enlarged intake manifold, forged pistons, and new, better flowing cylinder heads. In 1988, the 225 horsepower 5 liter HO engine was the sole engine option for all Mark 7, and it continued that way until 1992. Unlike the Mustang, the Mark 7 stayed speed density through to the end of production in 1992, while the Mustang changed to mass air in 1989. Transmissions The diesel used a ZF 4-speed automatic overdrive unit with a lock-up torque converter. I couldn't find much info on it, but it was said to be smooth and properly geared for the diesel engine. The ZF transmission came as a package with the diesel engine from BMW. All of the gas-powered Mark 7s used Ford's AOD transmission, automatic overdrive. The AOD was a 4-speed automatic transmission with 4th gear as overdrive. This is the same transmission used in many 80s and 90s rear-wheel drive Fords and Mercuries, including the Fox Body 5-liter HO-powered Mustangs and Capris. The AOD shifter has no detent for 2nd gear. The shifter has 1st drive and overdrive detents. To manually select 2nd gear, you have to learn the AOD shuffle. And first, ready to shift to 2nd, push it forward. When the transmission shifts it down, pull it back and that will actually keep it in second gear and when it's in second gear you can you can stay in second all you want or when you're ready to shift to third gear push it back to drive it shifted into third gear very simple this is called the AOD shuffle I drag raced the Mark 7 on the regular my car was practically stock I saw no elapsed time or mile per hour improvement by doing the AOD shuffle. I just let the transmission do its own automatic thing. Suspension. All Mark 7s had factory installed air ride suspension. The front suspension used McPherson air struts. The rear suspension used solid rear axle with a four link, conventional tube shocks, and rear airbags. 1984 to 1990 Mark 7's air suspension systems were tuned more for handling in the LSC and more for comfort in the non-LSCs. 91 and 92 cars all had LSC style airbags. Brakes. All Lincoln Mark 7's came equipped with four-wheel disc brakes. 1986 and up cars came standard with anti-lock brakes. Differential. The 1984 to 1985 Mark 7s used a 7.5 inch differential. The 86 to 92 Mark 7s used an 8.8 .8 differential. Both units were similar to their Mustang Capri cousins, differing only in axle shaft length and having the addition of rear disc brakes. Ford Traction Lock Limited Slip units were available for the 7.5 and 8.8 .8 variants. Wheels. 1. LSC 84 to 87 15 by 6 inch wheels with 2 15 65 15 Goodyear Eagle GT black wall tires. 2. 1984 to 1987 15 by 5 and a half inch wheels with 2 15 70 15 white wall tires. 3. 84 to 90 15 by 6 inch wheels with 2 15 70 15 white wall tires. 4. 84 to 87 15 by 5 and a half inch wheels with 2 15 70 15 white wall tires. 5. 1986 to 87 15 by 6 inch wheels with 2 15 70 15 white wall tires. I know the 80s were crazy times, but this design had to have been cocaine related. <laughs> Hi. 6. 1988-89 16 by 7 inch wheels with 225-60-16 Eagle GT Plus 4 tires. 7. 1990-92 LSC with LSC center caps and 1991-1992 Bill Blast with Bill Blast center caps using 225-60-16 Goodyear GT Plus 4 tires. Models. The Continental Mark 7 was introduced in August 1983 as a 1984 model. Initially, it was available in three different trim levels. Base trim level, Bill Blast edition, Versace edition, and LSC, Luxury Sport Coupe. The base trim level was available from 1984 to 1987. The Bill Blast was available from 1984 to 1992. The Giovanni Versace was available from 1984 to 1985. The LSC was available from 1984 to 1992. The Special Edition was available from 1990 to 1992. Interior. Generally, the Mark 7 had two different characters. The designer editions were softer and more luxurious. The LSC was the brute in the suit and it had more of a sporting character. The interiors reflect this. 
A combination of 190,832 84 to 85 Continental Mark 7s and 86 to 1992 Lincoln Mark 7s left dealer showrooms. The Mark 7 commercials were a typical 80s mix of bold statements and campy boasting. It wasn't quite what these experts expected. It's the new Continental Mark 7. Not long ago, they took this new kind of luxury car out for a ride. To fully appreciate the superb handling and performance of Lincoln Mark 7 LSC, the makers of Mark 7 urge you to do these three things. Drive it. Drive it. Drive it. Lincoln. What a luxury car should be. Performance. In 1984, Motor Week reported a 0 to 60 time of 9.7 and a quarter mile of 16.8. In 1988, Motor Week reported a 0 to 60 time of 9.1 and a quarter mile time of 15.6. Although slow by today's standards, the Mark 7 was quick by 1980s standards. I went to my favorite bench racing site, 0 to 60 times, and both 1984 and 1988 Mark 7 times were comparable to performance cars of the time. Downright quick as compared to their German rivals from BMW and Mercedes. Aftermarket performance. The Mark 7 is basically a Fox Body Mustang 5 liter in an expensive suit. So, the aftermarket performance parts for this car are literally limitless. The stock speed density computer will tolerate most bolt on performance parts. Major changes like a blower or aftermarket cylinder heads require a switch to a mass air based computer system. Manual transmission swaps are common and reasonably straightforward as the Mark 7's cousin, the Thunderbird, Turbo Coupe, came from the factory with a T5 making a Mustang T5 an easy conversion. Engine swaps are also common. 351 Windsors, LS engines, and even the mighty Coyote. Call me sacrilegious, but the LS makes the most sense horsepower per dollar and ease of installation to me. Racing. Mark 7 does not have much racing history. I assume Ford had the Mustang and the Thunderbird, and Mercury had the Capri and the XR4Ti for that, and saw no reason to take the Mark 7 racing. The Mark 7 was campaigned in Trans Am racing by Russ Thuss. Thuss started racing the Mark 7 in 1984. He ran six races between 1984 and 1985. The best finish was ninth place at Watkins Glen. Sadly, the car was totaled in a wreck at Indianapolis Raceway Park in 1985. The 1984 Lincoln Mark 7, created by PPG, was an IndyCar World Series pace car. It must have been a fun ride with 465 horsepower and a 5-speed transmission. It wasn't a race car per se, but it paced Indy so close enough. It's currently for sale, too. Anyone have an extra 55,000 American I could borrow? On that note, please remember to like and subscribe. I did find an impressive Mark 7 drift car. I also found some guy autocrossing the Mark 7. I see you still got that driving skill. Oh. For the most part. <laughs> The Mark 7 is a popular car for drag racing. The whole hot rod Lincoln, Mustang and a Tux reputation aside, the 302 HO matched with the four-link Fox body rear suspension makes for a great basis for a drag car. That Mark 7 took that Magnum to Gapplebee's. The Mark 7 was really never designed or engineered to be a race car though. It was intended to effortlessly waft down the road in the utmost luxury and comfort riding on a cushion of air. Holy crap! Did you see that? Another jackalope sighting! Run. Buying a Lincoln Mark 7. Haggerty claims the average value of a 1991 Lincoln Mark 7 LSC to be $6,100. An absolute bargain if you consider Haggerty's average value of a 1991 Mustang GT to be 12100 Both cars are 99% mechanically identical, and the Mark 7, in my somewhat biased opinion, are a far nicer car. So far in this series, I have personally favored the earlier cars. In this case, I personally favor the later cars, or the latest cars. Leaving the fact I owned a 1991 Bill Blast out of the equation, I would still choose the 1991 or 1992 model year.
The styling changed very little over the nine years, so you might as well get the legendary 225 horsepower 302 HO and the gorgeous 16 inch styled BBS wheels. I would be hard pressed to decide between the Bill Blast and the LSC, as the LSC has sportier seats and the Bill Blast had the totally awesome 80s dash. Things to look out for Rust. The Mark 7 was far from a rust bucket, but the Tin Worm does enjoy eating a few choice spots. The front fenders are lined with insulation that traps water and rusts the bottoms of the fenders out. Make sure the drain at the bottom of the back window is clean and clear. If it isn't, the trunk can fill with water and rust out the lower quarter panels and the area under the back window. The front strut towers and surrounding areas are also known to rust in all Fox body cars and the Mark 7 is no exception. The Mark 7 self levels itself, but if the car appears to have a very low ride height, this may be a sign of airbag issues. If the owner tells you that the condition fixes itself when the car is turned on and this condition is normal, they're incorrect. You can purchase a Mark 7 with air suspension problems very cheaply. If you're handy, you could save a lot of money purchasing the car, as the system is pretty simple and there are step-by-step -step procedures for logically, methodically, fixing them. There are several aftermarket companies that supply parts to fix them. The other option is to convert the car to coil springs. There are both documented auto-racking shopping lists and brand new kits available from Strutmasters to convert the Mark 7 to coil spring suspension. The Mark 7 is very electronically complex even by today's standards. It is a good idea to test absolutely everything works properly. I used to joke that the only thing without a gadget or electronic motor was the hood, and that was not far from the truth. The world is divided on the AOD transmission. Some love it, some hate it. But most would agree it's the weak point on the Mark 7. During the test drive, ensure it's operating correctly and count the shifts. There should be four. Faulty transmissions are known to skip second gear and or not go into overdrive. The best time to buy a Mark 7 is now. The prices for good cars are increasing. The prices on all 80s and 90s cars are on the rise in general. The Mark 7 is iconic, and it is a historically important car. The Mark 7 is a very usable classic car, easily keeping up with modern traffic. It gets reasonably good fuel mileage. It has a boatload of muscle car-like torque to amuse you. And due to the popularity of Fox Body Mustangs, it will have a steady stream of replacement parts indefinitely. Thanks for watching this episode of Jason Bowman Loves Cars and my story of the Lincoln Mark 7. I hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to like, subscribe, and comment, and buy your favorite YouTuber a 1984 Lincoln Continental PPG Pace Car.